Now we want to return back to 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter in our study. And if you have your Bible there, we invite you to follow along. And we trust that you have our notes and outlines also to go along with this. Because now we're talking about concerning scandals in the Corinthian church, and there were lawsuits among the members, as well as impurity. Now it's concerning marriage. And I said we'd be discussing the subject of sex, and we are, but I think in a more dignified manner than it's being handled today, because we're going to follow Paul here in it. And what we're talking about is actually this problem of marriage today. Now, Paul gave them the spiritual apparatus that by its application, the problems could be solved that relate to sex in marriage. Now, will you listen here as I read verse 1? Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, they wrote to Paul about this problem, and Paul was a long time in getting to it. In fact, you'll notice he handled all these other problems here before he got to this particular problem. And you see that this man, Paul, he has no reluctance in dealing with it, because he deals with it here rather boldly and very frankly. And before dealing with the text, though, I think that probably we ought to consider two introductory matters. One's a question and the other's an explanation. First, the question is, was Paul ever married? Now, if he was not, then he was theorizing here in his explanation. He knew nothing from experience. And Paul never did that. Paul always spoke from experience. And it's not the method of the Spirit of God in choosing writers. The Lord doesn't choose a man that knows nothing about the subject on which the Spirit of God wants him to write. And so we have always assumed that he was unmarried. And the reason for it is because of verse 7. He says, "...for I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner." Another after that. Now, we assume that Paul was not married, and I think we need to pay attention to the next verse here. And a great many will say, well, well, you paid attention to it. We'd certainly get the impression Paul was not married because he says, I'm reading now, I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Somebody says, see, it says... He's saying to the unmarried. Well, we assume he was unmarried, but he mentions two classes there, the unmarried and widows or widowers to be the one. And it's difficult to believe that Paul was unmarried because actually of who he was and because of his background. Paul was a member of the Sanity. And the rule for the Sanhedrin was that all the members were married. That was the first condition. You could only be a married man. And Paul mentions in that marvelous confession, or his testimony gives in the 26th of Acts, and it's a glorious thing. In verse 10 he says, "...which thing I also did in Jerusalem, many of the saints, did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. How could he give his voice against them? It was brought before the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin voted on it. And Paul says, I always voted against the Christian. Now, Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. That in and of itself says he was married, because all members were married. Now, there was an insistence upon Jewish young men to marry. The Mishnah said at the age of 18, and we find that in the Yebamoth, that's a commentary on Genesis 5-2, it says, a Jew who has no wife 
is not a man. And that's something that we, by the way, should pay a little attention to here. And I believe, therefore, Paul was married. Now, I think Paul was a widower. I think he had never remarried, because over in the ninth chapter, verse 5, I read this, "...have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas?" And I think Paul is saying, I could marry again if I wanted to. I'd be permitted to do that, but I'm not going to do that for the very simple reason that I feel like in my ministry that I would not want to ask a woman to follow me around in the type of ministry that he had. Now, Paul, I believe, had loved some good woman in the past who had reciprocated his love. He spoke so tenderly of the marriage relationship in places. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, we'll have to return to that, but notice that, and I want to read to you now a statement of Canon Farah in the life and work of St. Paul. And here it is. The other question which arises is, was Saul married? Had he the support of some loving heart during the fiery struggles of his youth, amid the to and fro contentions of spirit which resulted from an imperfect and unsatisfying creed? Was there in the troubled sea of his life one little island home where he could find refuge from incessant thought? Little as we know of his domestic relation, little as he cared to mingle mere private interests with the great spiritual truths which occupy his soul, it seems to me that we must answer this question in the affirmative. And may I say that's been the position of many expositors of the Scripture, that this man, Paul, had been married, his wife had probably died. And Paul never made reference to her, but he spoke so lovingly of this relationship that we must believe that he was. Now, the next thing that is introductory, not a question, but a statement. And that is, we need to understand the Corinth of that day. And if we don't, we're going to fall into the trap of saying Paul is commending the single state above the married state. You must have the local color of Corinth and know what he's talking about. Now, I'm going to read verses 1 again and then read verse 2. Now, concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Now, we need to understand Corinth. Now, that was a city that was dominated by the acro Corinthus. I have been there to the ruins of ancient Corinth, and towering above those ruins is this mountain that is there. That was the Acropolis. It was called acro Corinthus. It was unusually high. On top of it was the temple of Aphrodite, and it towered over the city like a dark cloud. Today, there's the ruins of a crusader fort there, and that crusader fort, of course, in ruins today, but the stones that were in the temple of Aphrodite were used to build the fortress. Now, this temple was like most heathen temples. Sex was a religion. There were 1,000 vestal virgins there, so-called, And in that temple, you could get food, drink, and sex, because those vestal virgins were nothing in the world but 1,000 prostitutes, and sex was carried on in the name of religion. That was the philosophy of Plato, by the way. Tell the truth, a great many people don't seem to realize. I never shall forget, a man said to me, he says, you know, Socrates wrote in very lofty language. Did he? Well, sometime he did. But he also told prostitutes how they ought to conduct themselves. 
May I say to you that the whole thought was get rid of the desires of the body. How? By satisfying them. That's hedonism. And you have the two basic philosophers of the Greeks, Stoicism, by not satisfying the other Epicureanism, and that's going all the way. Now, the wife in a Roman world was a chattel. She was a workhorse. And a man generally had several wives. One was in charge of the kitchen. The other was in charge of the living area. And another was in charge of the clothes. And sex was secondary. Because the man went up to the temple. That's where the good-looking girls were. And he went up there, and they had these seasons of, they celebrated of fertility. And believe me, friends, that's where it was carried on. And you'll find today among the Bedouins in the land of Israel, they have several wives. And it's a practical thing with them. One takes care of the sheep and the another one goes along with the man as he wanders around. The other stays back where they have a home base. They generally have a few fruit trees around and probably a tent there, that sort of home base. Well, he needs three wives at the least, you see. And so in that day, that's the way it was carried off. Paul now is lifting marriage to the heights. Paul says here that you're not to do that. You must have someone that you love. And this is the man who lifted woman from the place of slavery in the pagan world of the Roman Empire. And he made her a companion of man, restore her to her rightful position. Now, he was in Ephesus when he wrote to the Corinthians, and there was that awful temple there of Diana. And it was to the Ephesians that Paul wrote and said, Husbands, Love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself to it. Now, somebody says, yes, but he told wives to obey their husbands. And I'd like to know where he said that. Now, I know somebody's going to say, yes, it's not Ephesians 5.25. You should read it. It's Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband. Have you ever looked up that word submit? Have you ever realized what it really means? It means wives respond to your own husband. She's to react to the man. Man is the aggressor. He initiates every expression of love. And the woman is the receiver. She's to respond to the man. It's not just a matter of sex. Mentally, spiritually, psychologically, and physically, man is the aggressor. Woman is the receiver. God created them that way at the beginning. He created her as a help me. What is a help me? answering to man. She's the other part of man. When the husband says, I love you, then she says, I love you. And when a man today admits that he has a cold wife, he's really saying something. He means he's a lousy husband, by the way, and that he is to blame for the condition. Now, Paul here is lifting the slave state, a woman to that as a partner of man. Will you listen to him? Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Likewise also the wife unto the husband. She's respond to him. He's to say to her that he loves her. Verse 4, The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. He's not to run up to that temple of Aphrodite. That's sin in Paul's book and in the Word of God. Now he's saying... He's to stay home, and the love and the sex is to take place at home. And that is exactly what he's saying here. He goes on in that same spirit here, by the way. The only motive for marriage is love, not sex, but love. And I'm convinced that Paul had known the love of a good and great woman. Another reason? Every man in Scripture who ever did anything for God knew the love of a woman, Adam and Eve, Jacob and Rachel, Boaz and Ruth, David and Abigail. And she's the one that said to David, you are bound in the bundle of life with God. And then Paul, some unnamed woman, said to John Wesley, you know, that when he came to this country that actually he was not saved then. He told us that. He said, I came to this country to convert Indians, but who's going to convert me? Now, the story goes 
at one of the governors where he was, had a very beautiful wife. He was an old man, and she was a young, beautiful woman brought out to the frontier to this country. There's that handsome young missionary, John Wesley. And Wesley must have fallen in love with her. And she told him, she said, no, I can't leave him and go with you. And you must go on and follow God. She bade him goodbye and sent him back to England. I think that woman he married must have found out about that because she had a great deal to say about that sort of thing. There are other phases of this problem, by the way, that Paul deals with in this chapter, and we must reserve it for another time. Mixed marriages, divorce, and all of that sort of thing. But we need to understand that Paul is dealing with this subject here. So let me keep reading, and I'll drop down now to verse 6. He says, "...but I speak this by permission and not of commandment." What's he talking about? He says, "...defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again. Satan tempt you not for your incontinence." Now, he's not saying that he's not writing this by inspiration. He's just saying this is not the rule by any means. This is not a commandment. He says, "...for I would that all men were even as I myself." Now, at this time, he did not have a wife. He didn't take one around with him, but he had had a wife. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, none after that. Now, some men have actually, in the ministry and in the Lord's work, have not married, some not for years. They are that way. But the Lord Jesus, you remember, said, Some men are born eunuchs, some make themselves eunuchs, and others are made eunuchs by men. And there are many men that make that kind of a sacrifice. Now, I attempted to imitate a man when I began in the ministry that was a bachelor. And I thought, boy, that's the happy state. And I thought a bachelor's a fellow didn't make the same mistake twice. But I found out that wasn't for me. I wonder why. And I think that this is not a rule. <laughs> it's not a commandment. He says, I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows... It's good for them if they abide even as I to the unmarried and widow. He says, if they can, but there's no rule. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. It's better to marry than to burn, that is, burn with passion. Now, verse 10, and under the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. Now, he says, I'm putting it on the line. This is commandment. Let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried. Now, if you are going to leave your husband, and regardless of the reason, you're to remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, let not the husband put away his wife. But the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Now, if you're married to an unsaved man or an unsaved woman, you have children, you should try to make it through. But if you cannot, he says here, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. And my thought in this particular connection is that Paul may be saying here that if a woman has been deserted by a godless husband, is she to marry or can she marry? This is a mooted question. I know that. But I would say that Paul is granting that permission here. But I think that each case should be examined on its own merits. And I think that a lot of times a wife gets rid of a husband, a husband gets rid of a wife, or forces them to and does it purposely in order that they might feel like they've got scriptural grounds, at least, for divorce. Now he says, For well, what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? And that ought to be the goal of the wife. I know several women married to unsaved men. I know some saved men married to unsaved women. 
and they've tried to win them. That should be uppermost. But verse 17, but as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. So ordained I in all the churches. And he says that just as you are, that's the way you should stay if you can. And that ought to answer the question today. Unfortunately, there's some ministers and evangelists that have advised certain people that have got a divorce and remarried that they should go back to their first husband or go back to the first wife. And may I say, I can't think of anything that's been more tragic than that in several cases. I know a case of where one woman went into a mental institution because an evangelist had told her that that's what she should do, go back to a drunken husband And she had established a lovely Christian home, by the way, and had been saved and all of that. How foolish can you be? I think we need to probably read Paul and know what Paul is saying. By the way, that's important. Now he says, As any man called being circumcised, let him not become uncircumcised. As any man called in uncircumcision, let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Be obedient to Christ. That is the thing that's important. Now, circumcision was a commandment in the Old Testament. Now you're to be obedient unto Christ. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Now, God saved you today. Stay right there, brother. I don't care what your past was. You're not to go back to some godless wife or godless husband. God never asked that at all. You can see, let every man abide in the same calling. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. The whole point here is, whatever state you find yourself in, stay right there. Now, he said this would apply to any relationship. For instance, if you belong to the circumcised, if you're an Israelite, well, don't try to become a Gentile, (laughs) And if you're a Gentile, don't try to become an Israelite. Just come to Christ. And it's not necessary for you to change. He says circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Now, these things that divide us believers today actually ought not to divide us. And that's one reason that I find myself today able to mix with all groups who hold to the Word of God, the deity of Christ, In fact, he died upon the cross for our sins. And I cross over lines all the time. In fact, some of my minister friends are amazed by it. I actually have spoken to some of the leading Pentecostal churches. One man said to me, he's on radio, he said, how is it that you beat them on the head and they have you and I'm nice to them? Well, I said, you actually are not nice to them because of the fact they have a question in their mind or whether you really believe in the inspiration of the Scripture. Now, these minor things ought not to divide us. And I consider a great many things minor and certain things that are essential. Now, as to the essentials, when we agree on that, I don't care how he practices, for instance, baptism. I don't care how he practices the Lord's Supper. I don't care how he practices other things. He may do a lot of things that I don't agree with, but that's no reason for me to break fellowship with him, you see. A great many people think, and I'm afraid a great many businessmen, they get converted and they get interested in some Christian organization. Then the next thing, I know I have one of them that will come to me and say, now I'm thinking about giving up my business and going into Christian work. Well, the chances are especially if you're a successful businessman, God's given you a gift to minister in that particular area. And he doesn't intend you to go into full-time Christian work. Now, when you were a slave, a servant of a man, don't try to get loose from that, thinking that is what God wants you to do. It may not be. You may be tied down to a business today, maybe making money. Well, God, chances are that's where he wants you. You see, now that you become a Christian, there's no reason to give that up at all. And if you today are a housewife, and I find that a great many housewives get the notion that they are to become some great Bible teacher or that they are to get concerned about that, 
and actually some of them neglect their families because of it. I never shall forget the story I heard about the late Gypsy Smith. He didn't believe in women preachers. And one woman came to him in Dallas, Texas, and said to him, Gypsy Smith, I feel called to go into the ministry. And he asked her a very pertinent question. He had a way of doing that. And he said, by the way, you married? She said, yes. said, how many children you got? She said, five. He says, that's wonderful. He says, God has called you into the ministry, and he's already given you your congregation. That's her congregation, you see. Don't try to get out of the place that you're in just because you've been converted. You're bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of man. That is, now, you've been redeemed, but now don't become a slave to somebody, some individual. Now, that would answer the question, would it not, of the cocktail waitress. Now, we had a case here on radio, and it was a local case of a young lady that was a cocktail waitress. She got converted. And very frankly, this is all brand new to her. Her question to me was, should I give this up? And she says, I don't feel right doing this now. And I said, well, now, that's going to be up to you. That's a decision for you to make. But you have a conviction you should give it up. And if you ask me personally what I think about it, I think you ought to give it up. But don't give it up because I say so. You give it up because you come to that conviction. And she gave it up. Now, I suppose two weeks after that, she was free from that and got another job. You're bought with a price. Be not the servants of man. Now, we come down to verse 24. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called, therein abide with God. Now, that's the important thing. When you're converted, whatever you are doing, wherever you are, in that position, can you be free in your relationship to God? Can you put him first? Now, that's what he's going to discuss, because now... In the remainder of this chapter, he's going to answer the second question that they brought to him that is related, by the way, to the first question. And all of this must be looked at in the light of those local circumstances. It must be looked at in the light of what Corinth really was, and then interpret that in the light of the day we live in. And the second question was this. Corinth was such a corrupt place. And manhood was corrupted here. Any time that woman becomes corrupt, manhood will go down. That's always been the story. And so the question had arisen in Corinth among Christian parents now who had marriageable daughters. What should they do? Before they were converted, they knew this drunken sot that they had met in Corinth made trips up to the temple of Aphrodite, went up and associated with the prostitutes. Now, what should the girl do? What should the single girl do? And verse 25 now, he's answering that question. Now concerning virgins. Now, you will notice one or two translations have made that virgin daughters, and I think that clarifies it. I think that's what we're talking about now. Now concerning virgin daughters. What should they do? Paul says, I have no commandment of the Lord. Now, this revealed that Paul knew the commandments of the Lord Jesus, of what he had taught. And he says, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I have my judgment. Paul said, I give you my opinion in the light of the fact of what? As one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. Now, Paul says... I've obtained mercy of God. And that was the basis on which he said we should let Christians judge our affairs because they know what the mercy of God is. They've obtained it. Now, Paul says, I've obtained the mercy of God, and I want to be faithful to God, and I'll give you my judgment. Now, what is that? He says, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. Now, the present distress was that awful situation in Corinth, which Paul knew was not going to last. And somebody said to me the other day, do you think this new morality, this lawlessness is going to continue? It can't continue, friend. 
It'll bring down our house eventually if it does continue. And then it will be ended, that is for sure. But the thing is that it's just a present distress that we're in today. Now, I take it that he's referring to that situation that existed in Corinth. He says, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. That is, what now is he going to say? Well, listen, verse 27, Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. Now, he says, is your present situation, since you've come to Christ, are bound to a wife? Stay with her. She is unsaved? Stay with her as long as you can. Are you not married? Well, then, in the present distress, the tremendous immorality that was there, it'd be best to remain single. Now, that's what Paul is saying. But he says this is his judgment. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. It's certainly not sinful, Paul is saying, at all. And if a virgin marry, that is, a virgin daughter marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. But I spare you, Paul says, I'm saying this to you to save you from quite a headache, you see. Like the country boy was being married, and the preacher said to him, Wilt thou have this woman to be thy lawfully wedded wife? And this young fellow said, I wilt. And I guess he did. By the way, believe me, the sea of matrimony is a rough sea for anyone today. The divorce is in Southern California, now about equal to marriages. And when they get ahead of the marriages, that's going to be something, you know. That reveals that we have a present distress. Now, Paul is going to say in the light of the present distress, there are several things that he's going to discuss with them, you see. He'll mention these now in light of the present distress. The time, he says, is short. And there's an urgency, an immediacy. And because of that, it doesn't only apply to marriage. Why, it applies to other things. And he's going to mention five things, all of them necessary, all of them inevitable, all of them actually the common experience of man in this world. And let me just enumerate them, and we'll take them up here. Marriage, sorrow, joy, commerce, and then just the world in general. All of these, now, we have a relationship to. Now, notice what Paul says. You couldn't escape these. Marriage is the first one. Paul says, sure, it's all right to go ahead and marry, but you remember, you're going to have trouble, and you will, by the way. That's something that we, on counseling, I've always tried to tell young people that the romantic period will pass. And when the first month's rent comes due and there's not much money in the treasury, believe me, the romance might fly out the window. Now, will you notice? Now, he says, verse 29, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. In other words, Paul says that regardless, because of the times, are you putting God first? That is, can you act as if you're not married? And then he goes on to bring in these others. And they that weep, that sorrow that'll come to us, as though they wept not. Are you going to let some sorrow, a tragedy in your life, keep you from serving God? And they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, are you going to let pleasure take the place of your relationship to God? Many have done that. And they that buy as though they possess not, are you going to let your business take the place of God? Many a man today has made business is God. And verse 31, and they that use this world is not abusing it. Now, you and I are in the world, not of the world, but that doesn't mean we are to walk around today with the attitude of touch not, taste not, handle not. We can use this world. I, I made a trip up into the Northwest, and I just stopped many times and look upon those glorious forests that they have up there. And I want to tell you, I can use them. They blessed my heart. I enjoyed it. But I didn't fall down and worship any one of those trees up there. 
There's some pretty hefty trees there, too, by the way. But they that use this world, not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. Are you caught up today in the things that the present man said to me the other day, why don't you have long side burns? <laughs> well, I don't know. It's all right. It's a fad. And certain wide neckties and wide lapels are fashionable. But that narrow lapel suit me. May I say to you, do these things control your life? Or does Christ control your life? Now, that's what he's talking about. And he says, as he moves back into this area, verse 32, "...but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord." He's just giving now this observation that an unmarried person doesn't have to worry about, you know, changing the children's dieties or going out and buy food for them. He can give his time or she can give her time to the things of God. But he that's married careth for the things that are the world, I may please his wife. And that's normal, natural, and it's not wrong. Paul's not saying that. What Paul is trying to say here is... Are you putting God first in your life? And he discusses that. And I'm not going to pursue that through the rest of this, but we find that Paul is making it very clear that the important thing is to put God first, and that should be the determining factor for every person in a marriage relationship. Now, can you put God first in your marriage? And I don't care who you are and how spiritual you may think you are, you're not putting God first in your marriage, then that marriage, my friend, is not the ideal Christian marriage. That is the thing Paul, I think, makes very clear here. And he's saying that this, by the way, is his judgment. He says, verse 35, "...and this I speak for your own profit." Again, he comes back to it that this is his judgment and his feeling in the matter. Verse 40, but she is happy if she so abide after my judgment. And Paul says, this is just my advice to you that this is the way that it should be. And the important thing in any marriage relationship is not whether it's legal or what will the church say. What will my fundamental friends? important thing is, Can I serve God? Am I putting him first in my life? And there are many so-called Christian couples that are not putting God first in their lives. And they're getting along all right. They're not going to divorce court. But that's not ideal. That's the thing Paul is saying now in this particular chapter. Now, friends, we've come to the eighth chapter of 1 Corinthians. And last time we were looking at this question, actually, of sex. Paul faced the questions boldly. It had to do with marriage and divorce. It had to do with marriage and its relationships. And Paul lifted it to a very high plane. And he was answering questions that the Corinthian church had sent to him. Now, also, they had some other questions. And we are now dealing here, beginning with chapter 8, concerning Christian liberty. And that will take us into the first verse of the 11th chapter, and it deals with several aspects. Now, here in chapter 8, it deals actually with meat, whether we should eat meat or not, and the liberty that a child of God should have in this particular area. And this, I trust, will be very helpful as we look at what Paul has to say here, and also that we recognize that In this first section, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he calls them carnal, babes in Christ, and these things are carnalities that he's talking about. But here's where the church lives and moves and has its being today, and these are pertinent questions today because, well, it's a carnal church that we're in, and these become the important things rather than spiritualities. But we want to deal with him. Paul dealt with him. Now, this subject, I think, is just as controversial as the one that has to do with marriage and divorce. You see, diet is a fad with many people. And right at this present moment, 
It's just a fad with me, but I'm needing to get on a diet because my doctor tells me to. And so diet becomes a pretty important item for most of us. And it's interesting that it's generally an essential part of the ritual of most cults and isms today. You find most of them dealing with diet. And a very interesting thing is that God gave to Israel certain restrictions about eating meat. The outward test of the animal was that part a hoof and chew the cud. That eliminated the pig, of course. He parts the hoof but doesn't chew the cud. And there's certain fowl that were designated by name as unfit for food. And you find over in the 14th chapter of Deuteronomy, it's also in Leviticus, where we find this list given. And you will find in verse 12, "...but these are they of which ye shall not eat, the eagle, the ossifrage, and the osprey." A friend of mine who doesn't believe that you should eat meat, he belongs to a cult that practices that. And he was discussing that with me, and I asked him one day, I said, "...have you ever eaten an ossifrage?" He says, a what? Well, I says, an ossifrage. He said, don't even know what it is. Well, I said, you better find out what it is, because you may come over to my house someday, and I may serve you roast ossifrage. And if you eat it, you'll be just as wrong as you eat pork. Well, you know, he didn't know what an ossifrage was. He knew what a pig was, and he wouldn't touch pork. But he may have eaten an ossifrage. I hope not, because it doesn't look to me like an ossifrage and an osprey would be very good to eat even. But the Lord put them outside the bounds of what his people could eat. Now, why did God give that to them? Well, he makes it clear. He says here, Ye are the children of the Lord your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all nations that upon the earth thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. And therefore God prescribed their diet for them. And diet is important. There's a difference between pork and lamb. And even doctors today prescribe diet. Certain meats are out. Others are included. Now, will you notice some things here that we should, I think, say as a preliminary consideration? First of all, let me say as we get in this eighth chapter that doubtful and questionable practices is the area we're in. Now, the Bible grants a permission for certain practices. There are certain things, though, that are positively all right. That's okay to eat that. Given a green light relative to it, I don't think under any circumstances that the Lord didn't say that you couldn't eat papaya, as far as I know, and I'm glad he didn't say you couldn't eat it, because I like it. And I love fruit, and apparently most fruit was available. And there are certain things that he's given a green light to. He never said prayer was wrong or singing was wrong, except when I try to sing My wife thinks it's wrong for me to even try. But apparently you make melody in your heart. Teaching the Word of God, I never felt under any conviction is wrong. And working with my hands, I never thought that was wrong. Now, the Bible forbids certain practices. The red light's put up there. There's no argument or question or doubt. God condemns drunkenness. No use trying to defend it, friends. There are those that want to argue today about whether you can drink wine as a Christian and that type of thing. All I can say to you, drunkenness is condemned. And you can't get drunk unless you drink alcohol, that's for sure. And the works of the flesh are manifest, Paul says. Uncleanness, fornication, these things are wrong. In fact, drugs is listed there. Now, the Bible is silent on certain practices. There's a between area, a gray area, and it's neither black or white. Certain questionable practices, doubtful things. It's one we don't know too much about. Let me just mention something, and I'll let you argue it. I'm not. 
Should a woman use makeup? What about the miniskirt? We probably could have taken that up in the last chapter, by the way. Is it possible to be a Christian and smoke? I'm not answering that. All I'm trying to say is that these do come in the area of questionable things. Now, in my Southland, many of the churches say that mixed bathing is wrong, but smoking is all right. Out here on the West Coast, they think mixed bathing is all right. And believe me, it's mixed out here. But smoking is verbatim. You just better not, or you put out a certain circle. Now, you see, these are rules that have been put down by Christians They may be good or may be bad. I'm not even going to argue that today because I want you to see a great principle here. And then there's another preliminary consideration, and I want to develop this because this is important. If you miss seeing the background of this, you're going to miss the whole point. And it's simply this. The best place to eat in Corinth was not at Howard Johnson's, or Holiday Inn, or McDonald's, hamburger places, or some of these others. The best place to get meat was in the temple area, or a meat shop that was run by the temple. Now, you find in the city of Corinth, and that's the background, that people brought sacrifices of animals to offer. And they always brought the best, you see. But when that meat was offered to the idol, it didn't stay there long because they figured that the spirit of the idol ate the spirit of the meat, so the meal is over. And so they just took the meat, took it to the marketplace, and in the shambles it was offered. The stalls were there where meat was sold. Now, if you wanted to get the best fillets and the best porterhouse steaks and the best prime rib roast in Corinth, you had to go to one of those meat shops. And that meat had been offered to idols. And the Corinthians wrote Paul that there were some there that were offended. They would be invited out for dinner to another Christian family and they would be serving them a lovely filet mignon. And during the course of the conversation, said, My, this is wonderful meat that you have. Where'd you get it? And then they'd say, Got it up at the temple butcher shop, or the temple market. And they were offended by it. Oh, they wouldn't eat anything that was offered to idols. Now, Paul is going to discuss this question here. Should you eat things offered to idols like that? And that was the problem in Corinth, because some of them, with that background, who'd come out of idolatry, they were offended by that sort of things. Others, well, it made no difference. Now, will you listen to Paul here as he discusses this problem in the city of Corinth? Now is touching things offered unto idols... We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but love edifieth. Now, the whole point was this. Knowledge here blows up. That is, sort of like a balloon, <laughs> or like you pump up an automobile tire. But love doesn't blow up, it builds up. And love for God, then love for others. And love should be that which should judge our conduct, and not always knowledge. Knowledge it puffs us up. And that is the grave danger today. A great many folk feel like that they know something, but they don't know all. And Paul makes that clear. In verse 2 of chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, he says, And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. I had a man in a conference. In fact, we had had a marvelous service in where about six young men had accepted the Lord. And he came up and he wanted me to break away from everybody and discuss with him the subject of election because he felt like it had come up in the sermon. It had not. 
but he thought it had, and he wanted to discuss the subject of election. Now, I took a few moments to talk with him until I discovered he didn't want to discuss it. He wanted to tell me what he thought about election. Well, I listened to him, and I could discover that he had been reading on that subject recently, and that he knew a few things, but he didn't know everything. And because he knew a few things, he thought he knew everything. And as I listened to him, I could picture this young preacher. That is, I'm not young now, but when I was young, I could picture this young preacher who went into a theology professor and wanted to tell him what he thought about election. And I thought I was telling the professor something. Well, I don't care what stage of spiritual development you end today. You don't know everything about any subject, and I don't either. (laughs) We today are in the process. Paul could say that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his suffering. Paul says on this basis now, we have a certain knowledge, and because we have that certain knowledge, why, we may be governed by it. But we ought to be governed by love and not by knowledge. Now, listen to him, as concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. Paul says, now those of us that have knowledge, we all have knowledge, now that we've come to Christ and we have the word of God, We know today that an idol is nothing. And that's the way Paul spoke of idols. They're nothings. They're nothing. There isn't but one God. And so when you took that meat and offered it before an idol, that's nothing. (laughs) Nothing happened to the meat. It's not affected. It's not contaminated at all. In fact, that's where you get the best meat, is that which had been offered there. But it's nothing. And therefore, the instructed Christian, he could go and eat. No problem. He went there and bought his meat. Now, will you notice, he goes on to say here, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be God's men and Lord's men, a lot of idols about, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Now, These things are just merely called God. Now, yonder in the city of Corinth was the temple to Apollo. I've stood in the ruins of that temple. And not long ago, and as I stood there, I thought of this passage of Scripture. There had been stuff brought in, offered to Apollo. There's a big image, an idol of Apollo there. And that's nothing. (laughs) Whether the meat was brought in from the slaughterhouse and put in the meat shop or whether it was brought by this idol and put there for a little while, but it wouldn't make any difference. An idol is nothing. An instructed Christian knows that. They just merely call God. Now listen to Paul now. But to us, there is but one God. To us today, and this is the affirmation now of Paul. Now, verse 7, how be it? There is not in every man that knowledge. You see, the fellow today that calls himself the spiritual Christian and the separated Christian is really the fellow that doesn't have the knowledge. Oh, he says, you can't do that. May I say to you, well, what do you mean I can't do that? Well, he doesn't think you can. And there were those in Corinth that were offended by these people who invited them to dinner and then offered them meat that was sacrificed to idol. Well, they knew that. Idol is nothing, but these others, they're separated. They say, ooh, we wouldn't touch it. But their separation is not due to spirituality, it's due to ignorance. Paul says here, I be it, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. They are the weak ones. Actually, the carnal Christians. But they just are offended by that sort of thing, and they criticize. Oh, they'd gossip about you if you do that thing, you see. Now, Paul puts down here a great principle, and here it is. But meat commandeth us not to God, 
For neither, if we eat, are we the better, neither if we eat not, are we the worse. Now, meat hasn't anything to do with it. You remember Simon Peter was in that group. He'd been brought up, certain things unclean. And when that sheet let down to heaven, and the Lord says to him, Rise, slay and eat. Simon Peter says, Not so, Lord. <laughs> Calling him Lord, and at the same time not obeying him. He says, I've never eaten anything unclean. The Lord says, Don't you call anything unclean that I've called clean. No longer do I even make that distinction between clean and unclean animals. You can eat any animal you want to. If you want to eat it. Down in San Antonio, Texas, I'm told they can rattlesnake. Now, if you're going to have rattlesnake for dinner, don't invite me over. Because really and truly, it's not that it has anything to do with religion. But it sure does have a lot to do with a weak stomach. I just don't think I could go that at all. It's a great principle. Whether you eat meat, whether you're not. Meat won't command you to God. You can do as you please in this connection. This is the liberty that a Christian has. Now, notice verse 9 here. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Now, it's not a question now of meat after all, is it? It's a concern for others. You have the liberty to eat it. But what about your concern for others? You have the knowledge, but what about the love? It may have an effect on a weak brother. Listen to this. For if any man see thee which has knowledge, said it meet in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? I suppose that one of the reasons that those of us in Christian service shouldn't do certain things, I'm confident I can go to many places today I don't go to. I really don't have much of a desire to go to them. There was a time when I loved to dance. But the minute that I started studying for the ministry in college, actually the president of the ministerial student was president of the student body, and he led in the dances. And he tried to get me because he knew I'd been active in an organization before I accepted Christ where I was chairman of a dance committee. Well... I told him, no, I couldn't do it. Now, is it wrong? I'm not going to argue that point with you at all, my friend, because it's not a question of knowledge. I think there are a lot of things I could do. I don't do them. Why? Well, it's on the other basis. I don't want to hurt my weak brother here. Next thing you know, he may be out there, you know, dancing the fandango or whatever they dance today, and I'm not going to be responsible for him at all. Because he's a weak brother, you see. Now he says, And through thy knowledge, verse 11 now, Through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Now you see, we're on a different principle today. It's not a question whether it's right or wrong. It's a question about the effect on that weak brother, on that other fellow there, your neighbor. Now, you see, knowledge, after all, is a pretty dangerous thing. It's the way you use it. Now, what's the motivation? Verse 12, But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. You're affecting him. And knowledge becomes a very dangerous thing. Now listen to it, the last verse here. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I'll eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Now, he's going to be back at this over in the 10th chapter and 23rd verse. All things are lawful for me. All things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Now, don't tell me today that it's wrong for me to do certain things. You tell me whether I'm going to hurt my weak brother or not. That is the motivation for Christian conduct. The motivation is love. You sin against Christ when we sin against a weak brother. This is not radical. You know, we can change this, and it's not an unwarranted use. If clothes make my brother to be offended, well, I'm going to wear no clothes, no, but I'm going to be very careful about the kind of clothes I'm going to do that. Should a Christian eat where liquor is so? Should a Christian go to a show or to a dance? Well, the question is not right or wrong. 
not a question of knowledge. It's a question now, my friend, about your effect upon your weak brother. And that's the thing that is all important. All things are lawful for me. The liberty of the Christian. He's not pinned down by legality. He's not circumscribed by strict rules of conduct. The liberty is limited by love. That's the important thing. And if I invite somebody for dinner, I don't want to serve something that's going to offend him, you see. I want to serve something that be a blessing to him. That's the way that Christian conduct. Is it right to eat meat? Sure. <laughs> eat all you want, friend. Anything you want, you can eat. But what about your brother, your weak brother? What about that neighbor of yours? These are things that are important. Now, today, our study brings us to the ninth chapter, and we're in this section where it's concerning Christian liberty. Now, we saw that last time related specifically to the question of eating meat, and that was one of the questions that the Corinthian believers had brought up. And it applied specifically to Corinth of that day because the sacrifices were brought in to the heathen gods. Then the meat of the sacrifice was offered for sale in the shambles of the day. And many of the Christians were offended by eating meat offered to idols. Yet Paul says in Christian liberty, whether you eat meat or don't eat meat makes no difference. And after all, an idol is nothing. So it would make no difference whether you ate meat or not, and it wouldn't make any difference whether you ate meat offered to idol. There's only one problem, and that one problem was just simply this. The question is, would it affect my friend, my neighbor? Would I cause him to stumble? And therefore, we are going to find and have already found that liberty is limited. There is a limitation on our liberty. And if I may put it in a rather crude manner, you have a perfect right to swing your fist any way you want to. But where my nose begins, that's where your liberty ends. You can swing it any way you want to. But you've got to leave my nose alone. I hope you will. Now, we find that Paul puts down this great principle for the believer Back in chapter 6, he said, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. And then again, over in chapter 10, at verse 23, he'll say it again. All things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but each his neighbor's good. Therefore, whatever's sold in the shambles, eat. But if I have my neighbor in for dinner and he's offended by it, I should not have that. My Christian liberty has its limitations, and this is the way that it is. Now, Paul is going to illustrate this matter of Christian liberty in another field, and in a very personal field, and it has to do with two things, and that is it has to do with his right as an apostle. And I probably should say his official right, his right as an apostle in a very definite way. Then he's going to deal with his right to be supported by the church. He had a right to expect the church would care for him and all of his carnal affairs and as a preacher of the gospel. And that, may I say, is very personal. But Paul deals with that in this chapter, and it illustrates Christian liberty. Now, will you notice in the first one, he defends his official right as an apostle. And he begins, because Paul was in the habit of defending his apostleship, he had to, because it was challenged in many places. Now, in Corinth, he begins in chapter 9, verse 1, Am I not an apostle? 
And the answer, of course, is, yes, Paul, you are an apostle. That's the way the question is asked. That's the answer, and the only answer that will satisfy this question. Now, he says, am I not free? And the answer is, yes. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? That was the test of an apostle. That was the test that he had to pass. And Paul had passed that test. And he says, are not ye my work in the Lord? That was the evidence of his apostleship. And then he defends that. He says in verse 2, if I be not an apostle unto others, but he was, but this is the if of condition, yet doubtless I am to you for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. So that As far as the Corinthian church is concerned, he didn't have to defend his apostleship. It was evident to the Christians there that he was an apostle. Now he says, mine answer to them that do examine me is this. And the word answer here, actually in the Greek, the word means defense. My defense to them that do examine me is this. It says, if Paul was in court, It's as if he's been charged, and now he's making a defense here. Now he moves into this realm, verse 4. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Paul says, as an apostle of the Lord Jesus, I have a right to eat and to drink. And as an apostle, I have that liberty. Now that liberty is curbed and curtailed by others. The whole question is, he says, he had made the bold statement, if meat make my brother to a fan, I'll eat no flesh while the world standeth. Why? Lest I make my brother to a fan. Now, he could eat it, but he's not going to. And by the way, that is an exercise of your free will, is it not? To be able to do something and then not do it. And in one sense, That's the higher liberty and the highest liberty that there is. Now, if you can't do anything and you don't do it, well, there's no exercise of free will there. But if you're able to do something and you don't do it, then that is a revelation of free will. Now he goes on to say, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? And as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, evidently the brethren of the Lord here were his half-brothers. James and Jude, I take it, were actually married. And out on their missionary journeys, they took a wife with them. And Paul said, I have that freedom also. But Paul felt that his ministry would be curtailed, be hindered. Paul says, I have that freedom. Now, if a minister... And especially if you're out in Bible conference work, if you don't take your wife, they wonder what's wrong, what's happened. And if you do take your wife, they say, well, he can't go anywhere without her. So I mean a preacher's in a bad way. I remember when our daughter was growing up, my wife stayed at home to take care of her. That was her first responsibility and see that she had her clothes, went to school and took care of her. And I'd go alone in Bible conferences, and I'd be quizzed, generally by some very curious saint, say, why isn't Ms. McGee with you? Well, I'd have to go into detail. Now she goes with me. My daughter's away. She's married. My wife goes with me everywhere. And I find that some of them, every now and then, I meet a curious saint. Does your wife go with you all the time? As if, well, can't you get rid of her or get away from her? May I say to you, you can't win in the ministry. I found that out. But Paul is meeting that same thing. Paul said, I have a right to take a wife with me, but I've made my decision. As we said before, we believe he's a widower. And then he goes on to say, Are I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working? Paul says, Barnabas and I can stay home. We don't have to go as missionaries. Our salvation doesn't depend on whether we are missionaries. Paul says that he's going to get to this matter now, paying the preacher. 
He says, Who goeth a war for any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man? Or saith not the law the same thing? For it's written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? He says, you know, when the ox is treading out the corn, what he does is they hitch him up and he goes around in a circle, walking on the grain, and that walks the grain, causes it to come out of the chaff, and then the chaff is pitched up in the air, the wind blows it away, and the good grain falls down on the threshing floor. Now, they don't dare muzzle an oxen that does that. Why? Because oxen's working, and you've got to feed him, and so he's not muzzled. Now, that's the way God takes care of the ox, and God made that law. Now, God says you're not to muzzle the preacher. You're to uh, at least feed him. I heard the story years ago in Kentucky of a preacher who drove a very fine horse, very beautiful horse, and he himself was a very skinny fellow. And one day, one of his officers asked him the question, because apparently it had been discussed, and the question was very point blank. says, how is it, preacher, that your horse is so fine-looking and you are such a skinny fellow? And the preacher says, well, I'll tell you. He says, I feed my horse. He says, you folks are the ones that feed me. Well, may I say, I think maybe he might have had a right to say that. Paul is saying that. He's saying that here he has a right as an apostle that's fed others, for it's written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sake? Now, God not only takes care of the oxen, he said that for our sakes. No doubt this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we've sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing that we shall reap your carnal things? Now, Paul says that in Galatians too. by the way, that if they've given to you spiritual blessings, riches, then you should share your carnal with them. And I've said this on the radio. It's not original with me. I heard Dr. Johnson down in Bible Town in Florida. I've heard him say it several times, and I think it's good. You ought to support the place that you get your blessing. Well, you wouldn't do it this way. Suppose you go down and you eat at a certain restaurant. Well, you don't go down the street and pay the restaurant on the other corner for the meal that you had at the other restaurant. Now, a lot of people are doing that spiritually. And this is a good place for me to make very personal application. Now, a great many people tell us that they get a spiritual blessing from the program. I read a letter, and may I say that this lady didn't go down to the restaurant in the next corner and pay her bill down there. She sent a generous offering to this program. This is where she gets her blessing. Now, if you don't get a blessing, I wouldn't support it. I'd certainly say that. And Paul is very Frank along this line, I see no reason why I shouldn't be in making this application. Now, he says this, If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we've not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now, he doesn't want to do anything to hinder the gospel of Christ. And therefore, he doesn't receive anything. Now, may I be very frank and make application with you? Some of my friends kid me about this. I received no salary from radio, and I'm still able to say that. And I want to be very frank. There have been some very wonderful people. And actually, God's been better to me since I retired than he ever was before, because, again, it was a question of feeding a horse, and then I was being fed by somebody else. But now I'm dependent on the Lord. And, oh, I wish I'd done this before because he's wonderful. I'm not complaining. What I'm trying to say to you is this, that the reason that I have adopted this policy is not to hinder the teaching of the Word of God. 
for the very simple reason there are religious rackets today. They, to say they're not is to be as blind as a bat. And I believe that today many men make merchandise of the gospel of Christ. Now, I don't want to get into that position. So I've taken this place, and it did mean quite a sacrifice for a while. But the Lord has been so good, I just can't tell you how good he's been. And therefore, I want to continue the policy so that I won't hinder the teaching of the Word. No one can come along and say truthfully that Vernon McGee, the reason he's staying on that radio and teaching the Word of God, because he really gets a big salary. But the Lord's been good to me. Oh, how good. Now, let me go on with this, because, oh, this has such personal application. He says, Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Now, that's God's method. And it's not wrong, therefore, for the minister. That's a blessing to people to be supported. And I've discovered that when people receive a blessing, that they, for the most part, they do support the place where they get their blessing. Now he goes on. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory and void. Paul says, I'm going to be able to say to you that you are not supporting me. You may be supporting the gospel, but not me. I'm not receiving anything for you. Paul didn't take a salary either. You see, he did tent making. Well, I can't make tents. Well, I can write books, and I also can hold conferences. So I'm in the tent making business in a way. Now he says, for though I preach the gospel... I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Now, if I cancel this radio ministry, I won't lose my salvation. But I tell you, woe is me. And I want to be very frank with you. Necessity is laid upon me. I dare not. Why, may I say to you, it's like a taskmaster with a lash. It says every day at this same time on your radio station, McGee, you better be ready. You are not. Why, you will not be on long after that. You have to do this. Well, that's my liberty. And you know what? I do it because of life. Now, verse 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. Thank God for that. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. And that permits us to say, I'm not doing this for an ulterior motive but I'm expecting a reward someday from him, and I don't think I'm going to be disappointed. He says, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Now he gives this very familiar passage. Under the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. Now, Paul says, I'm doing all of this because I'm out on the race course. I'm like an athlete out there running. Running for what? A prize. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And may I say, let's get out on the race course together, friend. You and I together can run a race. And in a human race down here, only one can come in first. But both of us can come in first if we're trying to get the Word of God out. Now, Paul says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, 
So fight I not as one that beateth the air. Paul says, I'm not shad of boxing. I'm not playing post office. I'm not playing at this thing. I'm not playing church. This thing is real, but I keep under my body. Bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway, is our translation. That's unfortunate. The word is our dokimos, and it should be disapproved. Paul's thinking now the judgment seat of Christ where rewards are given. In the next epistle of Corinthians, the second epistle, he'll talk about that, that we all are to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive a reward. Now, Paul says, I'm out on the race track trying to run, so I'm going to get a reward. And that's the reason that I'm preaching the gospel like I am. Now, Paul says, I have liberty. I don't have to come in here every day, friends, and make these tapes. It's not easy to make them, and it takes a lot of work. And I'm retired. I ought to go and sit in the corner. But you want to know something? I don't want to sit in the corner. It's the last thing in the world I want to do. And I do pray that when the Lord gets through with me, you take me. I don't want to, you know, be just around twiddling my thumbs. Paul says I'm out on a race course, and I'm running for a purpose. I want to receive a reward. And I think every Christian ought to work for a reward. I don't work for salvation. That was given to me. I was saved by grace. But my friend, if I'm going to get a reward, I'm going to have work for it. And I say that to you today. If you're going to get a reward, you better get out on a race course. Let's get out and jog a little together. It's great to get the Word of God out in these days.